been studying in the book of John uh, last several weeks. I apologize, you've been stuck with me. And uh, no, it's, it's a blessing, it's fun. And tonight we're actually going to go, the next chapter, last week we're in chapter 12, we're going to be in John chapter 13. And each week, um, there's, there's something that actually is being said, and God, Jesus, is actually saying these things. And, you know, one time there was a blind man, and he, God's asking him, basically, how do you see things? Do you see things properly? Then he talks about being a shepherd. Do you hear things properly? And then he asks, how do you respond to these things? How do you respond to these things? And then this week, um, I just want to shoot right out the gate because I want everybody to understand this, is that um, this life we live is very, 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 very fragile. This life we live is very, very fast-paced. I don't know if any of you live in the same state I do, but there are things that are catching on fire at a rapid pace. There is a lot, there's a lot more movement. I work in, the, I work for a fire department, and the, the 911 system, I'm not, I'm not kidding, is actually at its capacity in very many different fashions. The, the system just gets drained immediately. The world always has a tragic event. There's always some type of something that is being drawn to. We have wildfires. We have, and it's not even fire season yet, folks. That's normally in the fall. It's just hot outside. And there's a lot of people moving. And there's a lot of things that are hot. And it catches things on fire. It's kind of weird. But the beautiful thing about this Jesus is explaining these things and teaching us in ways that we have to be able to see and we have to be able to understand. And I, I hope I can make it a little bit clearer tonight because there is something that I just want to really drive home right out the gate. Is that Jesus loves you. This world we live in will tell you completely opposite of whatever type of ailment, whatever type of um, sin, whatever type of something that you have. And God's saying, hey, I've done this amazing thing and I have taken care of everything. Do you trust it? I've talked about God being able to completely sustain you. Completely sustaining you means that you have actually received this faith and you begin this relationship with God. I don't want to give you like some, some, some half truth. I will tell you this. If you start following Jesus, not you don't get rich. If you follow Jesus, you, you, don't, you don't, do not receive a, a sickness. You will not have a trial. If you start following Jesus like these things, they're, they're not just... And Jesus isn't the antidote to that. No, we live in a fallen world and it's completely out of control. But God's saying, I want to come in. I want to be able to be your foundation, to sustain you. You'll be able to walk with me through faith. There's nothing that you can do to earn this. There's nothing that you can strive and work harder for. But God is wanting to teach us to say this. I want to be used by you to glorify you. There are sins that we have. There are trials and tribulations. There are darknesses and things that completely just surround us. And God's saying, I can be glorified in these things. Some people are like, man, you are twisted sometimes because I like see really bad things. And, I'm, and then I'll get back and I'll just be like, man, give God all the glory in that. And they're like, how? What do you, what do you see? Literally, right now. There are children. We're sitting in here. We're selling roast beef sandwiches downstairs. There's things. We have a plethora of everything here. You can go down to the corner and get your fix right now. You can go anywhere you want and receive whatever your little self desires. That's the, that's the culture. That's the Western civilization. That's what we live in. And right now, as we speak, during this service, there will be children that die in our world due to malnutrition because they aren't receiving any type of food or water. Crickets. But God is sustaining that. And He's aware of it. And He knows exactly where the need is for each and every one of us. And to really just tell you beyond anything, Jesus loves you. 
He loves you so much that you can't wrap your head around it. God right now is providing for you as you just sit here. God right now is holding the universe at complete precision. But when I look at the world through my fleshly eyes, when I look through the world, I look at the world, I'm like, this place is out of control. And God's saying, no, I have it in control. Do you trust that? And are you willing to walk with me and trust that I have it all taken care of? Being loved is the most powerful motivation in the world. That's what everyone is searching for. Our ability to love often is shaped by our experience of love. We usually love others as we have been loved. Some of the greatest statements about God's loving nature were written by a man who experienced God's love in a unique way. And it's the book that we're in and that we're studying the Gospel of John. Jesus' disciple expresses his relationship to Jesus by calling himself the disciple that Jesus loved. In the Gospel of John, there is a central theme, a prophetic theme of love and grace. More than, the more you learn and get to know about the Lord's relationship and with you and with all of humanity, you'll begin to see that you are loved as well. Not only does God love you, He knows your heart. Jesus confronts us in the Bible, just as He's teaching His disciples, and He confronts John. We cannot know the depths of Jesus' love unless we are willing to face the fact that He knows us completely. God knows your heart. He knows your motive on why you're here tonight. Otherwise, we are fooled into believing we must love the people we pretend to be, not the sinners we actually are. John teaches us that God is able and willing to accept us right where we are. Being aware of God's love is a motivator for change. His love is not given in exchange for our efforts. His love frees us to really live. And my question is how do we accept this love? And the way we accept this love is through faith. Faith is received actually by something you can't see but something hoped for. And it's actually a measurement that God, that God talks about and then in the Word, it talks about giving each and every one of us a measurement of faith. It is not just some by sure chance that you actually believe that there's a creator. Let me give you some of my personal story. I was raised in church. I heard about the Bible my whole life. I heard about things and I watched and I watched and I watched. And I was totally blown away. I was like, man, this is crazy. I can sit there and tell you parables. I used to be that smarty pants kid that would get all the candy. And there would be people like snubbing me because, man, he got an extra gummy bear because he knew that Daniel was the one that was in the lion's den. He knew that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the ones that were thrown in the fiery furnace. He knew, and he was that kid. But let me tell you, I was raised in it, and let me tell you, it got comfortable. Very comfortable to a point where then the enemy in the dark world we, work we live in actually started to use it against me. I was actually in my mid-twenties and got a point to, in my life to where I was like, you know what? I don't even know if all this is real. This is a sham. None of these people love each other. They're all out for their own good. There are people that are getting hurt in church. There's this, there's that. Let me tell you, we're a bunch of imperfect people in God's perfect church. He's the one that sustains it all. And so I was in this big thing and there was times where I was just so messed up and I didn't believe and I didn't understand but God had a plan even, even during my dark blackout period is what I call it, of five years where I didn't step foot into a church. If 
if I ran into somebody that had some faith, I was like, you are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You are weird. I don't understand you. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried to run from God. At eight years old, I was at a church camp. I had this overwhelming feeling. Um, it wasn't an audible voice, but I could feel in my heart. I was listening to a minister, and he was calling out to young hearts saying, Hey, you will preach someday. In my heart, I spoke this. Not outwardly, in my heart and in my mind, I was like, I am never going to preach. I am never going to publicly speak. Those guys are nerds, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. There I am. 32. Eight years old, I have that. 32 is when I finally said yes to it. Had this blackout period when I'm completely, utterly insane. I was drinking, doing drugs, just you name it, going crazy. My poor wife's like, he has lost his marble, if you will. Like, he just lost it. I don't know what his deal is. I know that there was family and friends that were concerned about me. And I get to a point where God has this moment. Because I was about ready to lose everything. I was in dark, dark places. There was it, the, the world is not nice. It's mean. And it, it's, it's very, very destructive if you just go after whatever you want. And I get to this point where I just say yes. I say yes to God. And I don't want to turn back from anything. I don't want to, I don't want to stop this, this relationship. And the, my whole point of, of getting to this is this is why I believe in Jesus and in Christianity. I've studied a lot of other religions. I went far and wide. I've listened to all kinds of different concepts. I, every religion in the world that you will go up against in any type of faith, hear me out tonight. This is what you have to do in these types of faiths. You have to go to God to be saved. With Jesus, He comes to you and He saves you. He comes after you and He saves you. He actually comes and gives you the faith. And I was just wrecked. I, I, how did I miss all this in the Word? How did I not see all of this? It was all part of His plan because now I have this crazy amount of information for when people don't understand, and they are misconstrued, and they are looking, and they are searching. God has us go through things for His glory. He has us go through things so that we can see exactly His plan that He is sustaining. So my question is, you receive something, and you respond to it, then when you respond to it, how do you use it? How do you use this love? The question is, how do you serve? The Bible says faith without works is dead. Meaning you can't work for your salvation, but meaning if you have faith in God, you will do good works that he had planned all along. We're going to read in John chapter 13. How do you serve? John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? <laughs> Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. 
No, Peter protested. He said, no, you will never wash my feet, Jesus replied. Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well. Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for, his, except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean. But not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I tell you the truth, actually 15, I, get, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. This fulfills the scriptures that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it, when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. And I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me. And anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Jesus knew that his hour had come. Jesus lives his life in anticipation for this moment because things are really starting to move. This hour, Jesus knew he would be betrayed by one of his disciples. He'd be denied by another. He'd be deserted by all of them at one point. Still, he loved them to the very end. God knows us completely. To understand this, that God knows you completely. Ins and outs. He's designed you in every facet. He knows exactly that thumbprint. He knows exactly that DNA. He knows exactly how your brain works. He knows exactly who you are completely right now as you are where you are. That blows me away. He knows the sins we have committed and the ones we will commit. Still, he loves us, having experienced this love. How do you serve? Do you serve with humility? Jesus, as the lowliest slave acting here, he wraps a towel around his waist. The creator of the universe, the one everything was created through and for, wraps a towel around his waist. He kneels and washes the feet, the feet of the ones near to him. Even he, God in the flesh, is willing to serve. Just want to throw this out there. God will never have you do something that he's not willing to do himself or hasn't already done for you and taught you. If you want to hear from God, read his word. Pray, read his word. Pray, read his word. Pray, read his word. And we as his followers must also be servants, willing to serve in a way that glorifies God. This is a special blessing for those who not only agree that humble service is Christ's way, but who also follow through with it and do it. In verse 17, I'm going to read it again. Verse 17 says, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Our, the way we respond to it is by believing through our faith, but now God is asking, how do you serve? And he shows us. He actually goes and takes a step further here. He takes a knee. He actually goes to the feet. I don't know if you understand in this culture what is happening here. 
He's saying, I'm going into the back of the line for you guys. I'm the teacher, I'm the master, but I want to show you what it, what it is to actually get down and dirty and to love someone and show someone respect. Because he will bless you for it. And the complete opposite of doing such things is do you serve with pride and misunderstanding? Which sometimes I feel, because my feelings actually aren't 100% accurate, but I serve with pride and misunderstanding. I feel like I'm a pro at that sometimes. Check this out. In this part of the scripture, Peter is sitting there and he's watching Jesus washing people's feet. Imagine being Peter and watching Jesus wash the other's feet all the while moving closer to him. Seeing his master behave like a slave. Not understanding with total confusion. Sometimes we're just like Peter. When God is doing something in our lives, he is getting down in the dirty parts of our lives. It feels completely uncomfortable. It does not make sense and it's completely understandable. And we just don't get it. And you know what the first thing we do? We tell God what to do. We immediately are like, nope. <laughs> Look, Peter is telling Jesus, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And then Jesus is like, oh yeah, well if I don't wash you, then you won't be clean. And he's like, well then if that's the case, I can, I just, I'm like Peter, I'd be like such a smart eye. Well if that's the case, why don't you wash my head, my hand, and my arms, and my everything too. And Peter is saying, God, I don't understand. God is aware that you don't understand. But let me do the work. Let me wash your feet. Let me get dirty with you. Let me, under, let, me let you understand this. We don't need to question or tell God what to do. What's even better about this is God teaches us. Jesus is trying or is saying to be a leader, we must be servants. To be a follower, we must be servants. Jesus is saying to mature in Christ, you must be teachable and remain teachable. Humility at its finest. I don't know about you, but I kind of have this attitude sometimes is that I know it all. Maybe I'm the only one. And I'm like, no, God, this is how it's going to go, and this is how it's going to look, and this is how I want to feel throughout the whole process. <laughs> Peter is being taught about his misunderstanding and his pride. Jesus did not just wash the disciples' feet to show them to be nice to each other. He was teaching not only humility, but also to extend his mission on earth after he was gone. God was teaching all of us, including his disciples, that, that they were to move into the world serving God by serving each other and serving all people. And if we look at verse 21, <coughs> Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other wondering whom he could be. The disciple Jesus loved, who was John, was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him, ask who he's talking about. So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one who, to whom I give the bread, I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. 
when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry up and do what you are going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Jesus was troubled. In some translations it says that he was troubled in spirit. Judas, betrayal of Jesus, troubled him. Jesus was not unfeeling or emotionally just detached from the events surrounding him. He had passion. He loved Judas and was troubled for Judas' sake much more than his own. In this part of the story, Judas was actually given something in this culture was actually be the, it would be the guest of honor at the table. It would be the, the person that was going to be rewarded the most. And God was giving him actually, Jesus was actually giving him bread and juice. He would dip it in the cup to show the others on who the one that had the hardened heart, who the one, as we found out last week, was stealing money, who was the treasurer and the, the, the seer of the money. Judas was offered communion. It was a high honor and esteemed affection towards him at that moment. But Jesus was troubled by it. And to the world, if it was not obvious, like to the world and to, the, to all the other twelve, it was not obvious that Judas was the betrayer. After all this, the disciples trusted him with, the, with their money. I want to read you this and I want you to hear me out. Satan's part in the betrayal of Jesus does not excuse or remove any responsibility from Judas. Here in this particular moment, Judas actually has a choice. Just like you and I, God shows his love and affection, kneels, washes his feet, cleans him, Shows him humility, not just about it, not just tell him about it, but actually does it right before his very eyes. Shows him fully, then offers him a gesture of love by offering him the food in the cup. Judas, still fixed on himself and his love for money, makes a choice. Each and every day, we are, we are faced with this choice. The first choice we have is to serve God and life. God comes first before everything. Jesus is showing in this part, and he's showing on how fixated he is on what the Father's will is in every moment of his life. He is seriously, he knelt down other men's feet. He is constantly serving. He is constantly looking out. He is constantly staying focused. He says their master is not greater than the slave. The slave is not greater than the master. And the messenger is not greater than the person that, sent, that sends it. The, the whole concept that Jesus is putting together is saying, hey, I need you to put God first in every facet of your life. And you get a choice. Then on the contrary, or on the completely opposite side of that, and then uh, that I'm completely guilty of so many times a day, 
is that we can serve self and death. God in life, self and death. Self and death looks this way. Even though God has sustained you this whole time, even though you read the scripture and your heart hasn't been broken enough, even though we have been through every type of ailment, any type of sin, every single time, we constantly see it. It's day in, day out. Nothing changes. We have a hardened heart. We have no conviction. We aren't drawn by the Spirit. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 8. He says, hey, check this out. It is very important what you think about. If you think about your sinful nature, you will fall into your sinful nature. If you think about the Holy Spirit, you will follow the Holy Spirit. What comes at you every single day? I'm telling you, we live in this culture. We just It's constant. It's so fast-paced. Me, me, I, I. I want to feel good. I need this. I need that. God's saying, I'm providing everything for you. I want to feel good. I want to be happy. God's like, I'm here. What else do you need? My grace is enough. I'm telling you right now, every single one of us, each and every day, are fighting this battle. It's constant. There was bombs going off all around us in the spirit. God is trying to speak to us through his word on a constant basis. We don't even want to lift this. I hear it all the time. I don't want to read it because I don't understand it. Don't let, don't try to understand it. Let God move. He will speak to you. He will give you truth. It is not for you. It's actually for him. When you read this, it's not for you to feel good. When I read this, I'm telling you, I get broken. I get vulnerable. I get ripped apart. Judas had a choice at this moment. He, God comes and he says, hey, here it is. Jesus is like, here, you guys want to know what it is? They still don't understand. He even said it twice. Either God or life or self or death. And I'm telling you, this is how fast the Bible says that, that the enemy, the devil, and I, I want to put quotes on this, is like a lion, but he's not a lion. He's not. He actually, he can come to your doorstep, he can come to you, he can feed you all the lies in the world, but he can't take anything from you. He doesn't have authority. You either give it away, or you keep it. He is so fast and cunning. It is like, boom, he comes to your, he just enters your mind. You have this selfish, intuitive thought through your flesh. You are like, man, I really desire this. Or man, I would really, really could use this. Or man, I'm right here. Man, I can really, man, I need. Oh, man. And, and literally, we are constantly in this battle. And he comes to you like a lion to hurt you and destroy you. But actually, he's leaving with something that you gave him. My whole point of saying this is we have a choice and we don't even know we have the choice because it's already came and gone and the next thing we know we're sitting there like how in the world did I get here? Because you gave it away. You had a choice. I used to be this guy. Some people would be like, no way. I used to be this guy. I just punched people. There was, no, there was no discussion. There was no, hey, what's up? No, I would just punch somebody as hard as I could. <clears throat> I didn't have any type of compassion towards humanity or any other human heart. I was very, very selfish. I was very, very self-destructive. I was very, very destructive around everyone around me. I did not care. I was just giving things away and had no idea I was doing it. No idea. 
than if you look in verse 31. As soon as Judas <clears throat> left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. And God will be glorified because of Him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, He will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You showed me, or you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. Well, why can't I go now, Lord? He asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. The beginning of that, starting in verse 31, Jesus is saying that Jesus is saying that He is Lord. That He's come back to give glory and He will be given glory. He's showing His authority and knowing the Father's will, staying focused and to give God all the glory. And then right after that, just as the servant that he is, he says, I want to give you a new commandment. The new commandment. And the specific Greek text that this is giving is something completely new, but it's actually something that's been said for thousands of years. It's all over the New, it's all over the Old Testament. All over it. Love each other. Love each other. Love each other. Love each other. All over it. In Leviticus. In Deuteronomy, in Numbers, in First and Second Kings, he's coughed. It's, it's all in God's word. It's all in God's word, saying love each other. This is the difference, and this is the revolutionary part that Jesus is coming to say because he actually takes it a bit further, and that's why it's saying it's completely new. It's to love each other was not the new commandment completely. Jesus is saying, I want you to love like I loved you. To love each other. To go to the back of the line. To die to yourself. To receive what God has already offered. This love will not only bring believers to Christ, but it will also keep believers strong and united. There's something that's always, that's after the church and the body of believers. And I see it every day. I see it in all kinds of different fashions, and it's called division. Because love is at the forefront. God's saying it's okay for us to say, hey, it's okay. I love you anyway. So I ask you, do you serve in love? Of course, at the completely opposite, which I have done for many, many years of my life. It's been bickering, jealousy, division, all self-preservation. So I can feel good or I didn't serve at all. So God goes before us and teaches us. I'm going to have the band just come back up. You have a choice tonight. 
we have a choice to choose on who we serve. Whether we serve in humility, whether we serve it for Him, God is teaching us constantly. Do we love each other? This love goes so much deeper than this type of affection and this coming and going of a fleshly love. This love actually will chase you down. It'll find you right where you're at. And your most vulnerable point in your life, where actually God's word says at your weakest point, you're the strongest in Him. God wants to take everything that we have and allow us to serve the world because He says it. He says this love, this love that I'm talking about will actually show the world that you're my disciples. This place, week after week, I walked into here so broken, so broken, and I was nothing but accepted. I walked in, and I sat several rows in the back over here. There was about 40 people in here. I still remember his name, and I know he comes in and out. I don't even know if he's here tonight, but I love him so much, and God has a special place in his heart for him. But he prayed with my wife and I when we came in. His name's Russell. And he just, he poured out his heart in such a humble fashion. And he said, and he looked us in the eyes, and he said, I love you, and I'm so glad you're here. And I was just like blown away. Because I felt it, I knew it was only God speaking through him. God is asking you, how do you serve? Do you stay in your comfort zone? Are you worried about what everybody else thinks? Are you miss are you just have any pride or misunderstanding? He wants to teach you tonight. Are you teachable? King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is asking you, how do you serve? To love others the way Jesus has loved us is literally for us to die to ourselves and to give Him everything.